Good evening and good morning. I would like to welcome everyone to our first joint event in 2020. And I could never imagine we run a meetup on Saturday, but here we go. It happened. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank all the organizers who helped us for this joint event to happen, and especially to to our organizing team in Melbourne, Daniel, who is a director today of this show, and uh, Melanie, who is helping with the moderation of the chats, and also a few other people who helped us today. One thing uh, I would like to say is that uh, it's a special time, but this special time also brought us a rare opportunity, and that is to run our meetups online and also bring all our members together in a, in a kind of a, an online event so we can meet and we can greet. And hopefully this joint event is going to continue on. Now, before I start introducing our speakers, uh, I would like to thank you for joining us this Saturday, Saturday morning, and also our, our supporters and sponsors. We have PwC, both in Sydney and Melbourne, who are helping us for, for many years. We have uh, Google, Atlassian, SecDim in Sydney. We have Pripsec, Cyber, CyberGym, and CyberSec people who are helping us for, for, for quite a while now. Special thanks to you, to them. A few items before, before I introduce our first speaker. The first thing will be, uh, we always look for speakers, even at this time, we are running our, our meetups online. So please do get in touch with your local organizers. If you have a workshop that you would like to share with the others, if there is a CTF that you have created and you, know, you wanna see how people are solving it, or if you have a talk, short talk, long talks, please do get in touch with us. We do looking forward to get more people involved. The second item is tonight, we are going to have two channels to grab your thoughts, comments, and questions. The first one is a video conferencing service that we are self-hosting it. And uh, that will be our main channel that you can either directly ask your question from the speakers or one of our moderators will take your, your, your questions from there. Now, for whatever reason, if this service did not stood up, we we'll still have our good old IRC channel that you can jump in and have a chat. The, you should see the link for both of these services sometimes showing up on the screen. So please be online on both of the channels and continue the chat. Uh, so the agenda will be, we, we're going to have our main, main talk, well, that's, sorry, two talks. After each talk, there will be five minute time for questions and answers. And there will be a break, five minutes between two talks. And right at the end of the second talk, we will be having our 30 to 30 minutes to one hour online catch up in one of these channels that, that we have. I guess I have covered everything. I don't want to keep too much of the time now. So our first speaker is here with us to talk about DFIR. And she will going to talk about her infield experience, how to deal with artifacts and her, her own approaches and ideas, how to tackle them and a lot of lessons that she, she has learned. It seems to be that she started working in InfoSec by accident back in 2001. And for some reason, she find her way and her passion in DFIR, or Digital Forensic Incident Response. And in 2019, she has started her own business in Australia in this field. Let's welcome our first speaker, Shana, to present her talk on having more than one string to your bow. Thank you. All right. Uh, can you guys hear me? Can I get a thumbs up from someone somewhere that I am live? Anyone? 
Yep, you're all good. Thank you, thank you. All right. Um, hi, thanks for joining us tonight. I know it's 6 p.m., maybe dinner time. I've already been interrupted uh, already, asking if I'm gonna order dinner, to which I said no. Um, thanks for the organizers of SEP Talk Sydney and Melbourne. Um, this is a really cool thing to do given that we don't usually get to socialize with the other cities. So great work for putting it all together. Um, really great work with organizing and, and getting all the streaming set up. It's pretty cool what you've been able to do and, and all the infrastructure. So thanks for that. Thanks for having me along to ramble along for about 45 minutes. Um, might be a little less than that, given that this is my first time presenting to myself. Um, for those of you who saw ComfyCon, I, you know, did a couple of panels, um, made it a little bit easier. Um, so for those that don't know me, I've been working in InfoSec a little while now, so just over 20, 21 years. And I have spent um, the better part of the last 10 years focusing on digital forensics and incident response. I did start my own company last year. Um, and then earlier this year, about two and a half months ago, we actually were acquired by another company called Paraflare. So myself and Dan Eden are the directors of digital forensics and R&D at Paraflare. And we run all of the consulting engagements. So that's any of the IR work or compromise assessments, things like that. And we work side by side with the managed detection and response team there. Um, and I'm based in Sydney, just for, you know, for where I am. Uh, so as the intro said, I pretty much stumbled into information security and then stumbled my way into digital forensics, uh, quite luckily, actually. So when people ask me how I got in the field, um, I don't really have any experience about you know, giving advice on how to do it other than just take a chance. Um, my qualifications and learnings has been mostly on the job and working with some really, really brilliant people. Um, unfortunately, I've not so much learnt through osmosis as I would have liked, um, but learnt more through constant failings, um, constant, constant failings. Um, so I've been likening it to it to when I'm driving, I, I used to be really good at driving somewhere and remembering how to get there. You know, when I had to use a street directory and look up where I was going and stop halfway and look for landmarks. And, you know, I'd usually be able to drive there once using a street directory and then I'd know my way. Now, when I use a GPS, um, I can really find my way back somewhere. If I've, if I've not gone into how something's worked or, how how to do it myself, I find it really hard. So the way I learn is by trying, failing, understanding, researching, trying again, Googling, Stack Overflow, et cetera. Um, I also find that documenting my process as I go also really helps me because um, then I can go back over that process and refine it each time. Um, and I find that I learn something new and, and will find new ways to do things or a better way to do things. Um, that I didn't think of before. So that's pretty much how these last 12 months and even 2020 has rolled for me. Um, those that follow me on Twitter have probably seen me bashing my head against the wall a couple of times, followed by moments of yes, and then followed again by a few tears. Um, so I think the fact that I like to document my processes so much and break them down, is why I like um, doing training courses or, or teaching people that way. Um, I think it's a really good way to pass on knowledge. So it's a little bit harder when I'm, you know, doing a presentation because I don't feel like I can, I'll always get the point across. So I don't have the chat open right now. I did leave that closed just because of, you know, any bandwidth issues or having too many things open. Um, but I think the moderators are around, um, if there are any questions that people want to ask that are relevant to um, what I'm saying at the time, feel free to, to put your hand up and ask and, and one of the other guys can can ask for you. Or at the end, we can, we can have some questions there. Um, quite happy for that. So it's a fairly long title to my talk. Um, if someone had, and it basically it means if someone has more than one string to their bow, 
they have more than one ability or thing that they can use if their first one they try is not successful. And I really think that this sentence sums up digital forensics in a nutshell, um, honestly. Uh, there are days when things work smoothly and there are months and years where things just do not work like you think they should. Um, it worked yesterday, why doesn't it work today? Who knows? Um, so whether it's off-the-shelf software or open source, you can never tell what the DFIR gods have in store for you that day. Um, so when people ask me what I love about my job, it's actually this. Um, it's actually the fact that we need to be ready all the time to try something new. Um, every day is different. Um, and it's one of those things that you just have to be ready for anything if this is the career path that you want to take. So having many strings to your bow is something that you definitely need to learn and you do learn as you go through this, this career path. So I actually thought it was really funny um, and some of you from Sec Talk Sydney probably saw Phil Moore talk. Um, I think he was the last, last Sec Talk session for last year. Um, so it was really funny when I just logged onto Twitter uh, before I joined this and noticed he was having a similar day to many like I would. Um, have a spare half hour, so going to give this magnet CTF a go. First off, comp compiling a leap and I leap to see whether I can break them. Failed to execute. This happens all the time. Um, so I was like, that's pretty cool. I have something to illustrate exactly what I go through. Um, but this talk, I was sort of, you know, what am I going to talk about? So I decided to look at some of the blog posts that I've been promising all year. So I've been promising a, we a web shell blog post. Um, I've been promising a blog post on how I do business email compromise. Um, so I wanted to go back and do a little bit of a, a review of one of the, the cases that we worked on earlier this year. Um, which involved web shells. Um, so for, for us, I'm not sure for anyone else, but for us, 2020, there's not only been a year of droughts, floods, fires and plagues in Australia, um, but it's also has been the rise of the web shell for us. We've been seeing it quite a bit this year. Um, and there are probably many, many reasons for that, and I'm not going to go into that here. But whatever those reasons are, um, we've been presented with numerous cases this year involving web shells. Um, I don't want to assume anyone knows exactly what I'm talking about here. I know we're all from a really mixed background. Um, so a web shell is basically a malicious file that's loaded uh, onto a generally external facing web server via an exploitation of a vulnerability. So, you know, typically things like your WordPress um, plugins and, and um, web server vulnerabilities that allow uh, a, a remote actor to upload a file to a web, a web server. And then they're able to uh, interact with that via HTTP get and put commands, uh, post commands. Um, so that allows a backdoor functionality to the web server. And often, you know, depending on the web shell, they can do things like browse directories, they can download files, they can load files, um, they can pass commands to backend server, potentially pass commands to SQL databases. Um, they come in all sort of shapes and sizes. So one of the smallest ones that we've seen that's quite powerful still is China Chopper. So that's the first one. It's about four kilobytes in size. Um, it usually is just a one line of code like you'd see, and they add it to an already existing uh, website, um, a page on a website. So it's it's quite well hidden. Uh, and they can do a lot of interesting stuff uh, with China Chopper, even though it's so small. Um, and then it, to the bigger, more complex web shells. So that's actually a screenshot of some of the work Dan did reversing, uh, reversing an ASPX web shell that we saw um, earlier this year. Um, the functionality of this was, was huge. There was, they could do lots and lots and lots of stuff with this, with this web shell. Um, and the customer actually was alerted to a different web shell on their web server. Um, by their AV software, and I'm keeping names of uh, everyone out of the conversation. Um, so their AV software. So that file was uh, flagged as malicious around about the beginning of February, and that's you know when they engaged with us. Um, 
Ironically, at the same time, they had someone internally notice that one of the pages on their website had been defaced um, earlier in January as well. Uh, so we took a look around. Um, there were two, two things that, uh, two places we started with this investigation. Um, so we got a, an image of this web server and we got an image of the database server as well just to check if there was any lateral movement across to that. Um, and luckily also on that web server, there was a fair bit of web server logs. So those web server logs went back several months, which was you know, very, very good for us and for our investigation. Um, and I did cover the entire time, bre time period of the breach um, and assisted with um, us identifying when was the first time that all of this happened. So I've spent a long time avoiding using Elk um, Elk is the Elastic Log Stash Kibana Trio, and really at this point, I'd still been avoiding using Elk. Um, so for me uh, at this point in the investigation, I took what I felt like was uh, a little bit of an easier approach, um, maybe a lazier approach, and that was timelining uh, the disk in X-Ways Forensics. Um, so X-Ways Forensics is an extremely powerful forensics tool. Uh, it takes a bit of a learning curve. Uh, it is a paid tool. You, you do need to pay for it. It's not a free one, um, but it does what it does extremely well. So there is a, a timelining functionality where you can create a snapshot of your image and it will put a timeline of all of, uh, all of the activity that's gone on um, from a file system perspective on that image. So looking at that, at that timeline, we were basically really quickly able to identify um, what files were being loaded to the web server, uh, what they were named, uh, when they were loaded. Um, and these files were actually started, uh, started being loaded back in early October. Um, so we've got a time period of October was when the first web shells were loaded. And then the last one that they were alerted on was in February. So, we actually found during this, we actually found five distinct web shells loaded. Um, and along with that, uh, literally hundreds of dropped HTML files with defacement messages. Um, so using X-Ways was a really great way to um, get a head start because we knew the names of the web shells. Um, we knew where they were located on the disk. And then we now had a time frame with which to work with. Um, and so while I am a bit of a uh, not so great with Elk, um, I've gotten a lot better. Um, but Dan, um, who was, we were working on this case together, is pretty much a whiz with it. So the first thing that um, he did, once we dumped the web server logs from the web server, he dumped them into Elk. Um, and the beautiful thing with Elk is that you can do loads of searches um, you know, identify the names of the web, like the web shell files. So we're able to search on those, look at the access to them, look at the user agent strings that were accessing those URIs, um, filter on the time frame um, that we knew from the file system analysis, and also look and look at the time taken on the website as well. So in this screenshot, it's got you know, how long was the person there? I think it did milliseconds. Um, how long were they were they on that particular page? Gives a, a bit of an idea of when um, the most activity might have been happening um, with that web shell. So unfortunately, web shells and web shell activity is not logged within a web server log file. Um, the only way that we will generally see what is happening when somebody is interacting with a web shell is is if they have um, the uh, return. Uh, the logging enabled on the web server so that we can see what is returned, what information is returned from the web server back outwards. And that's generally not something that's ever enabled. Um, depending on the web shell too, sometimes the URI might include the, um, the command in it, um, but often not. Often we just see the attacker hitting the URI and we actually don't know what's going on. So there are a few things that we need to look at, time taken, the amount of data that was transferred, um, things like that. 
So the funny thing about this one was, was when Dan was looking at it, um, not only were there hundreds of defacement files, but there was also an illegal streaming service running on this server. So I don't actually have a screenshot of it handy, um, but uh, when Dan fan found it, he dumped a screenshot of Elk and you could see the, the data transfer and the access, and it was really obvious that there was something going on there. Um, and that was happening in around about uh, November last year. Um, so Elk was really cool in showing us this spike um, across the histogram when we we're looking at the web server logs. Uh, and we we're able to sort of look a little bit closer at that to know, oh, just take a look, what else was happening on this system? Because that looked pretty strange to us. Um, and it was pretty strange as well. Um, so after that, we'd had a pretty, it's, you know, a pretty good run in terms of finding the obvious things. It wasn't necessarily a, a hugely complex case or anything like that. Um, we'd gotten the information we needed from some of the disk images. Uh, we'd gotten a lot of information from the log files. We did get access to um, endpoint EDR tool. Uh, logs as well, but they didn't go back far enough. They were only available for seven days. And we did get access to their managed security service provider um, and their firewall logs as well. So we did look at things like the firewall logs between the web server and the database server to look for any traffic or how much traffic might have been sent and the time spent um, in those connections. But sometimes we you know, just want to do things just to make sure that we've got everything. I mean, we're pretty pretty clear that we, were, we had everything already, given we knew that the um, exploit that was uh, exploited on the web server, we knew the time frame, we had all of the web shell names, we had a lot of all of the activity. Um, but sometimes we want to just do some, you know, hygiene scanning or, or check for, you know, what we call the low hanging fruit, which you'd think would be easy. Um, but that's also not always so easy as well. So after we had you know, looked at this in um, X ways, we had pulled out the logs, we'd done all of the log review, we we're pretty confident in what we had. Um, but we also wanted to, you know, run some AV scans um, across what we were looking at. So um, when you're running AV scans across an image file, it it is fairly simple, but not always so simple. So there are some free tools out, that, out there that you can use to mount an image file within Windows. Um, Arsenal Image Mounter is one of them. FTK Image Mounter is one of them. Um, I've been strongly recommended to not use FTK Imager for mounting image files. Um, Arsenal's pretty good. Um, both of those tools will mount, um, you know, your Windows partitions as uh, drive letters on your system um, that you're using to do the analysis. So then you can point your AV scanners at those directories and scan that way. Um, you need to keep in mind if you're doing that, if you're scanning against any of the Windows system files, those permissions will also still hold um, with Windows once you've mounted that as a drive letter. So you, you'll often get a lot of files omitted um, if you do it that way. So there is another way and it is um, using X-Ways again. Um, so X-Ways will allow you to mount the directory, the image file, the partition as a drive letter within your system, but it's actually mounting its volume. Um, so the little, so almost like a, a virtual volume that it's created. So you, you're actually able to scan all of the files um, and get around your permissions problems that you might have if you're just mounting directly within Windows. Um, so again, X-Ways for us was a, a really great investment. Um, and a lot of uses, um, loads more use cases than what I could ever cover here. Um, so if you don't have X-Ways, you can also do this in Linux. You could mount the image in Linux and scan it. Similarly, um, we like to use a range of AV scanners, um, both commercial and open source. So we use, you know, for example, Clam AV, um, Kaspersky, Sophos, Windows Defender. Um, it's good. I know that, you know, we can 
look at virus total and, and have a look, but it's good to run some additional AVs, specifically if there's diff different AVs than what your customer runs as well, or, or you run on your system, just to see how many how many things that you pick up. Like I've, I've had cases in the past where we've picked up other malicious things that um, not necessarily were picked up by AV and were not necessarily picked up as part of an investigation. So it's it's a, you know, one of those checklist things that I've got on my what to do when I receive a disk image forensic checklist. Um, so how many files do you think our AV scans picked up? We ran about three or four different AV scanners across this. And I'll do the drum roll. Zero, absolutely none. Um, so we found zero malicious files on a disk image where we knew we had at least five malicious web shells. Um, my favorite emoji, I think, ever. So this was kind of curious. Um, and it makes sense given that the first time that the client AVs uh, pinged them about this was in February when the first web shell appeared in October. And that AV didn't even ping on the most complicated web shell there. Um, that one kind of slipped by in the beginning of November. So not really great, huh? Um, you know, customers like, well, had AV. Um, they also had a commercial EDR tool in place as well. Um, unfortunately, as I said, due to the retention periods, we didn't have any data from that EDR tool to go back and check. So we don't know at that point if anything was alerted um, on the EDR tool. Um, they, the client had just basically put the EDR tool in and set and forget. Um, I don't really think anyone was watching it anyway. Um, and I suppose the icing on the cake, um, if you could say that for us, was it also nothing was alerted um, via their managed security services provider as well. So we were then assuming that, you know, firewall logs and um, Web server logs were not generally being reviewed or not being alerted on anything that looked, you know, mildly suspicious. So, um, so all of those tools and still no detections. Um, so we're not, you know, talking about slamming any particular product or tool or team here. Um, my talk is about the fact that we need multiple multiple tools and multiple avenues in which to explore and find things um, and detect things. Um, it's not always, you know, a, a silver bullet, one pill for, for everything kind of thing when it comes to digital forensics and incident response, it definitely isn't. Um, but this, this really highlighted to me um, and the team about the importance of having these multiple tools and the multiple skill sets available um, and people, um, specifically people, um, and this is really rings true when you don't have a specific starting point to an investigation. So often we will get uh, an image file of a system and someone says, have I been compromised? Um, and we need to go off and take a look and, and do things like, all right, start with some AV scanning or pull out some artifacts. Um, and I do have other talks on, on what those artifacts look like and um, some training sessions that I think think we will end up doing over some kind of method like this at some point that we were going to present at B-Sides Melbourne. Um, so, you know, there are lots of avenues where we have to go, you know, what can we throw at this? What can we throw at it and what can we find? Um, but for this, this particular investigation, um, I mean, we, we did what the customer needed. Uh, we identified the exploited plugin, um, the time frame it started, uh, all of the files and the directories involved. Um, so what was put on the web server, um, in what directories? Um, was there any lateral movement uh, between those systems? Um, and that was using, you know, had the attacker been able to utilize the web shell to say, move on to or collect data from the SQL database that was attached to it. Um, so we were pretty much fairly certain that no lateral movement had occurred. And we're also fairly certain that none of the PII um, data on that web server had left. So customer was pretty happy um, and pretty much case closed for that. Um, and so we were off flying off to our next engagement. Um, 
hence the plane when we could fly, um, which we can't do now. Um, so that did prompt us to go back and take a look at, you know, when we're writing up our processes and our knowledge, um, what are these sort of general hygiene sweeps that we're going to do and what were we going to look for when we're looking for web shells and, and things that we want to make sure that we're finding so that we're always improving and always learning. So two parts to this was from a customer's point of view or from, you know, a person or an organization's point of view, what are the things that they could have done um, to be able to detect and respond to what we found? Um, log analytics was a big one. Um, that was the first thing, you know, we would recommend and we recommended back to the customer about looking at your logs. Um, the web shell activity was in there uh, for several months um, and it stood out. The anomalies stood out a lot. Um, so it probably would have led to detection happening in November and not February, um, which if you can reduce that time frame, is, is pretty good. Uh, file integrity monitoring is something else, um, if implemented, could have either alerted of files being dropped on the web server or even possibly um, prevented them. And EDR, so we don't know whether that EDR tool picked up these or not, but it also kind of brought to my attention, I went straight to the guys in the managed defense, um, sorry, the, the managed detection and response team and said, would we have detected this? Like, is this something that we're looking for? And they were like, yeah, we would have. We would have detected on, you know, the process, you know, the weird, you know, process calls or system calls, um, something that would have been looked abnormal. So, it got us thinking and got me thinking too about, you know, where my web shell blog post came up, um, that having the detections in place also only really help when you've got someone watching them. Um, but also what were some of the other things that we could add to our tool set to better, under, better identify, I guess, these, um, either we're in, a, in an image file or on a system memory or you know, file, file system, whatever that might be, given that antivirus was not very good at detecting um, web shells, which actually did surprise me because they're not that hard. Um, so from our perspective, we were definitely looking at Yara. So we ran some Yara rules across um, the, the disk image. So that's something now that's part of our, our um, forensic toolkit and checklist. Um, so Yara is a tool uh, that helps finding malware families. So it's not just looking for signature-based signature methods like an antivirus, but it's looking for common characteristics of malware families. Um, and it's we started building out some of these detections um, of web shells based on you know some of the characteristics within web shell families. Um, and they're pretty easy to write and they're, you know, e there's a fair few of them available, um, Yara scanning, Yara signatures on GitHub that you can get. Um, because while a PHP file or an ASPX file on its own may or may not be malicious, when you look at the content, contents or combination of one or more functions within that file, it may indicate malicious intent. So it gives us you know, here's a PHP file and here's a function that's probably related to something malicious and let's flag it and take a look. Um, there are heaps of communities out there that you can get Yara scanning um, signatures. Um, they are, like I said, fairly easy to write. Um, there are a lot of repositories which I've got in the next slide, um, but it also, drew our team and some of the guys within the managed detection and response team to create a web shell detection tool. So that's been a project that they're working on now. Um, and I'm pretty sure they're planning to release that um, publicly. So this is one of the really great things of um, joining Paraflare and working in a team of incredibly smart and passionate people is that if you have a problem, someone will be able to come up with um, a solution, 100%. Um, which is uh, a very cool thing to be a part of. Um, so they are writing that web shell, detect web shell detection tool. We've been using it internally now. We've been testing it. We've been using it on our cases that we've been um, had, had through the door in the last couple of months. Um, and so that's going to be really exciting. But there are also um, 
some blog posts. So I've linked to that blog post. So we could just do a, a Google search on Peter Mikowski. Um, he's got a couple of blog posts on using Yara to detect PHP web shells. Um, so even within the access logs and things like that, um, they are, you know, a good source of uh, where to start if you're looking at doing uh, web shell detections and Yara scanning and things like that. The other one is Florian Roth, who probably seems to be the godfather of Yara and has an incredibly large repository on GitHub of Yara signatures that you can use for free. Um, he also has a little company where you can sign up to their curated um, and pay for um, Yara signatures as well. Uh, I'm not affili affiliated with them at all. Uh, he's just done a lot of work for Yara and providing a lot of information back to the community. Um, so it's good to support people like that. And that's pretty much all. I know I've kind of gone fairly quickly and sped through. Um, it's pretty hard presenting on your own. Um, I'm hopefully probably going to get better at it uh, in the future. But yeah, in, in conclusion, um, whenever, you know, even simple and straightforward investigations that we do from, you know, what are our perspective, we do use a, a, a large number of tools. Um, lots of stuff I didn't mention in this. Um, you know, we were going to di deeper dives into more of the Windows artifacts if we needed to, if we were, if we saw that there was any movement from the web shell or if they were able to to take passwords and things like that, we would then start looking at the artifacts. Um, uh, but it is what makes this job so dynamic, that every day things change. Every day the way an operating system could write a log file or an application writes a log file changes and then it breaks the way that you do your analysis. Um, all of that kind of thing might sound completely frustrating, but it is actually a really cool challenge. Um, also, validating any tool that you use. It is really good practice to validate what you're finding with multiple tools. So using X ways to take a look and then also, you know, dumping those log files into Elk and making sure that everything lines up um, and makes sense. Uh, there is nothing worse than making a mistake in incident response or forensics. Um, and tools can make mistakes. Um, and the way we interpret tools can make mistakes. So yeah, so I um, hope this was interesting and I look forward to any questions that you might have. Um, I will look to Pedro to tell me if I need to jump onto Jitsi at all. Um, Thanks, Jenna. How was it? Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. It's really weird. Um, talking to <laughs> myself. Weird, right? Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I just, I, you know, my slideshow in front of me, my slideshow notes, and just don't look at yourself while you're presenting kind of helps. But, yeah, I'm just sitting here having a chat to myself. It seems fairly weird. Um, but thanks, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I, I think that even in this situation, the fact that we're all still getting together and playing really well as a community just speaks to, um, you know, all of the effort that goes into putting something like this on um, and the passion behind everyone that does it. So it's, you know, thank you so much for taking the time and, and putting all of this together. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jenna, but thanks for, you know, being here. I should say we had lots of activity on our IRC channel and also on this the right. GT Meet. Uh, come on, guys, there's a time for a question. We got one question now from... How do I spell this name? Guiley. And the question is, what version of X-Wave you were using? Or uh, I, say, well, I think it what was... What version of X-Wave did you use, Investigator or Forensics? I think it was Forensics. forensics right? Yeah, X-Wave Forensics. Yep. Everyone is uh, telling you that was a great talk. Brilliant talk. But, you know, there's a question I always ask. <laughs> and, you know, you are in a DFIR. Area. Yeah. Have you encountered any anti-forensic type? Yeah, issues? yeah, yeah. And you know definitely. what is the follow-up to this question? But how about anti-anti anti-forensic <laughs> techniques did well, you use? <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 I'm not going to talk on it because I reckon that um, Dan Eden, uh, who's the other director, has just we've just worked on a case recently um, that. 
he found something really, really interesting and I can't go into it. And it's one of those things of, this is why it kind of sucks um, doing case studies because you kind of can't talk about things a lot sometimes. Um, but it was definitely, you know, a fair bit of anti-forensics and, and hiding within um, common, well, not common even, um, but hiding within security tools, uh, activity. Um, so, we, yeah, we do see that a little bit. Not so much on, uh, you know, your crime, your crime gangs, I guess, when you're looking at the web shells, like, so these web shells, all of the defacements were, a lot of them were, you know, Indonesian hackers that were like, yeah, I'm cool. I defaced a website. Um, you know, we went on to zone H and looked there and yep, sure enough, there's, there's some of the, uh, you know, spoils of their war, um, on zone H. Um, so you know, sometimes it can be really, they're just going for opportunistic um, approaches here. So, you know, they'd have a, a legal streaming service running from this, um, you know, not really looking for financial gain uh, or intellectual property like some of the more sophisticated actors are. And, and they're the ones that we tend to see the, the anti-forensics and they, they'll borrow really deeply. Um, and you know what? So the anti-forensics, anti is a lot of being really stubborn. Um, you know, Dan was like a dog with a bone with it. He's like, I'm not going to give up on this. I'm going to, this looks so strange. It looks so weird. I am going to figure it out. And he got it. And, um, yeah, so, you know, anti-anti forensics tools is really a lot of gut instinct from the investigator. Uh, it's pretty easy to miss, but you just, you're looking at the activity and you're looking at what's happening, you know, while there's access to a web shell, why is there access or is this tool also running at two o'clock in the morning? That kind of thing. So, um, yeah, a bit of a bit of gut instinct goes into that. Cool, cool. Yeah. Now we got one more question from, I think, DRSH0. What are some of the more interesting web shell features you have seen? Um, well, the web show we found in this one was pretty interesting. I mean, they can range, right? I'm trying to think of an interesting feature. They're just, they, they're they full featured. Um, you know, you can send SQL commands. You can, um, you know, they, they'll set up their own passwords. So, you know, they have their own access, their own usernames, their own passwords. Um, they can browse directories, so they'll they'll go looking within directories if there's anything that might be of interest for them to find. Um, strangely enough, though, in in this instance of the case we worked on, they did do they did browse some directories, but they completely missed the directory that had all of the PII data there. Um, it was just pure luck, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, stupidity, whatever. Um, what else is interesting? Um, yeah. Downloading files, uploading files. I'm probably missing, you know, something else interesting. But off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I'd have to look into that and get back to them. Yeah, sure. And I guess if I haven't missed anyone's question, I hope not. But again, thanks again, Shana. No thanks worries. so much. Thank you for having me. I know it was first time. Talking. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be on Jitsu like, now like anyway. This. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll great. Jump so in yeah, we're gonna have China here with us till the uh, end of tonight. Yeah. And uh, so don't go anywhere. We will be back. We are having a short break with our second talk. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, before we go on to our next speaker, I just want to give a big shout out to um, Cybar, which is running an OSINT CTF on the 6th of June. Go check that out. And on to our next speaker. Um, some of you know our next speaker as the guy who casually drops a zero day in the design of his conference booklet and on a few Twitch streams. The co-founder of B Sites Camera, managing director of InfoSec, and known by some for his abundance of dad jokes and neat roasts. Um, our next speaker is none other than Silvio, speaking on the joys of memory corruption, um, modern browser exploitation. Go ahead, Silvio. Well, thank you uh, very much uh, for the introduction. Um, so this talk is all about uh, memory corruption and modern memory corruption. I think memory corruption and binary exploitation in general is a fascinating topic. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will hopefully see the joy of memory corruption just as much as I see it as well. So I'm gonna divide this talk up into a few sections. I'm gonna give an introduction to say why, well, what's the appeal of, of, of browser exploitation? What's the appeal of binary exploitation? Then I'm going to look at Firefox in particular. So this is all about gaming code execution in the renderer process of Firefox as a browser on a modern uh, Firefox browser, latest version. And we'll discover that we can exploit this given a memory corruption bug. So I'm going to inject a memory corruption bug to exploit to, to get code execution. And I'll take you on that journey of how to convert that into code execution. But you'll actually discover there's a lot of engineering involved as well. And it's really almost systems development now as opposed to, you know, cool hacking stuff. And of course, you know, in every, you know, systems development, there is maintenance as well. So we'll talk about maintaining our exploits and I'll conclude the presentation. So many people, I think, especially the sec talk, sec talks crowd has been introduced to memory corruption from things like the OSCP course. So if we look at the OSCP, um, content for memory corruption, um, pretty much that gets us to about the state of the late 90s. And that was, you know, those types of exploits were pretty common in the late 90s, and you'd be able to own uh, a lot of things. Now, since the early 2000s, and, and even sort of the, the transition between the 90s and the 2000s, um, OS vendors have introduced increasingly difficult to bypass exploit mitigation. So, you know, this is 20 years on now since sort of the birth of of you know non-executable stacks and there's been a lot of development in mitigation since then and then even in the past few years certainly uh, we've looked at hardware vendors like arm and intel introducing exploit mitigations in hardware and silicon so there's been a trend to move uh, mitigations from software into hardware as well which makes software exploitation even more difficult today so i suppose the question is who writes uh, you know these types of binary exploits and in my opinion, and this is just an opinion here, penetration testing isn't the traditional pathway to become an exploit developer, at least somewhat of an exploit developer. Um, and in fact, you're probably much more likely to find an exploit developer with a systems development background, um, you know, coming into it. So, you know, good systems development skills are probably necessary, but they're probably not sufficient to make you an exploit developer as well. But certainly every good exploit developer is, is capable of hacking on systems development as well. And I suppose what is the threat model for a sort of a modern exploit as opposed to sort of, you know, OSCP style exploit. And there are different sort of threat models that we can consider. We can consider near access type exploitation where we have things like Wi-Fi or baseband on a cellular, cellular phone or Bluetooth might be one type of access that we could, um, you know, an attack vector that we might be able to exploit. If we have close access to a device, maybe we're in possession of a device and it has a lock screen or something like that, pretty much any exposed interface is, is a viable option. So whether that's USB, HDMI, SATA, uh, Thunderbolt, especially, you know, especially recently with the Thunderbolt attacks, this is a sort of a good example of a close access attack. In this talk, I'll look at a remote attack against the Firefox browser. And this is sort of the terminology that we use. And if we think of browsers, they're part in sort of, you know, exploit terminology of the one-click vulnerabilities. And they sort of generally have this notion of interactivity that you have to have a browser that visits a malicious website or, you know, or, or, or for some other reason uh, has that requirement. In practice today, 
a modern, you know, a modern exploit is never really just a single vulnerability or even a single exploit. Um, a modern exploit is a chain of vulnerabilities that that gains you uh, persistent, ideally persistent access to a device uh, at full privileges. So in a in a browser exploit that leads to a jailbroken phone, you might require some sort of remote code execution in the browser. You might need a sandbox escape to escape the browser and gain full access as a user. Then you might need to privesc to gain kernel access, and then you might need some exploit to maintain persistence on the device in the presence of something like secure boot uh, or some sort of trusted system. So that, that's quite difficult. And if you have, uh, if you don't have one of those exploits, then you might not be able to gain full access and full persistence to the device. So Rhodium has a bunch of payouts associated with, uh, you know. It, that they will basically buy your exploits, your working exploits that, I, that I've been told. Um, they have payouts for, you know, a, a Windows remote uh, code execution, zero click, so a non-interactive exploit that will gain access to a Windows machine. They've got a Chrome RCE plus LP, so that's remote code execution, plus that Privesc, including a sandbox escape to do that. That's, that's basically what it means for that. So we can see a, a Win, Windows zero click is worth a million dollars for a desktop or a server. For a mobile device, an Android full chain with persistence, uh, zero click, so not interactive, maybe over some sort of messaging app or something like that, uh, is actually two and a half million dollars on Android and two million dollars for, for an Apple iPhone. With, of course, you need persistence as well. So that's pretty that's pretty pricey for you know for market price for a zero day, hundred thousand dollars for a desktop Firefox remote control execution. 500,000 for an equivalent in Chrome, um, $2.5 million for an Android zero-click full chain with persistence, and $2 million for a zero-click full chain with persistence on iOS. So what does this, you know, what do we mean when we're talking about, you know, a remote code execution uh, on, a, on, on, on a browser? What are we talking about? And this talk is all about gaining code execution in Firefox, uh, but we'll look at Chrome and see if we can give an example of that. This video wasn't playing very well, so I might, I'll try playing it and see if, seeing if it comes up. Otherwise, I'll just step through it to the different parts. And it's not playing very well, so I'll just step through the different parts. So we're just going to start the Chrome browser. Um, and I started that with this script here. This is just running a Chrome um, uh, browser. And the Chrome browser has been modified slightly to inject a memory corruption vulnerability in it. So a very simple memory corruption vulnerability. And then I've written a remote code execution based around taking that memory corruption and gaining code execution. This is in uh, uh, the, the, uh, the renderer process. Uh, so it doesn't do a sandbox escape and I've turned off the sandbox to do this. And you go to a, you know, you go to a site, got this HTML file that, that you, know, you probably shouldn't click on that. Um, I click on it and, and, and up pops a calculator. And you know, you know, browsers really aren't meant to do that. They're not meant to really pop up calculators um, at all. So that's sort of that's sort of what a, um, a remote code execution in a browser looks like. It runs the native code uh, outside that browser process uh, and you know lets you do other stuff as well. Of course, you need a sandbox escape to make that more useful. Um, but that's the first stage of our, of, our, of our chain, I suppose, of things. So now we'll talk about exploitation of Firefox. Uh, Firefox uh, is, is another modern browser like Chrome, uh, but uh, it's quite good. So for this, I'm going to inject a memory corruption bug, a simple memory corruption bug into the JavaScript engine in Firefox. So I've downloaded the source, I've modified the source and patched a small bug in it other than the injected bug, Firefox is the latest version with all mitigations on Linux. And from that, I will show you how the what the process is of gaining reliable code execution in this in this browser. Uh, so I won't go into sandbox escapes. Um, I'll, I will just talk about uh, gaining code execution. So the patch is, uh, there's sort of, um, this is what it's called. It's, it's actually a well-known patch. It's called BlazeFox. It injects a bug into JavaScript arrays. And it incorrectly, the, the patch to, that adds this memory corruption bug to, to the browser is extending this array to the size of 420. 
And it's not meant to do that. It's not meant to sort of extend that array. And it allows people accessing that array to access elements beyond the, the arrays defined or original buffer length. And that allows pretty much a simple relative out of bounds read and write primitive. So you know, that's pretty much it. So you create an array in JavaScript. You know, this is how your, your exploit is being delivered by someone clicking on your, your web page and it opens up some JavaScript. Uh, you can create an array and then you call this blaze function and you get this, um, this extended buffer. And then if you access, for example, here with access index 30, uh, it, it works quite well. So you, you've done an out of bounds relative read write memory corruption button. So the entire exploit is written in JavaScript. And the idea is to take a relative or out of bounds read write bug and turn this into an arbitrary read write primitive. And from an arbitrary read write primitive, overwrite a function pointer in the process to hijack control flow. So that's our high level strategy of how to exploit or gain code execution in, in this process. And how do we build an arbitrary read write primitive? This is really sort of one of the basics for, for modern exploitation is we generally need to build this strong primitive and from this strong primitive, we believe that we can get code execution and follow sort of our, 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 our plan. Now, the way that we're actually going to turn a relative read-write bug into an arbitrary read-write bug, so relative, we can just sort of you know, go you know, a little bit past our buffer, and an arbitrary read-write, we can go to anywhere in memory. The way we're going to do this is by taking, uh, taking into account that some um, JavaScript arrays internally in memory maintain internal pointers that are the backing store of the array content, okay? So if we can overwrite that pointer that's storing that backing store with an arbitrary location, so we're overriding this pointer with an arbitrary location of our choosing, and then we index that array from the JavaScript code, the access via that index to this array will be at that arbitrary location, and that's how we build an arbitrary read-write primitive. So we're just overriding a pointer in a JavaScript array, which is a backing store pointer. And then in JavaScript, we access that array and now it points to wherever we want to in memory. That's the basic thing. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing that we have to do is allocate our buggy array that has that out of bounds relative read write primitive. After we allocate our buggy array, we allocate a typed array. This is a JavaScript object, a JavaScript array. And the typed array is likely going to be adjacent to our buggy array or our relative read write bug um, in memory. And that's what we assume the allocator does. And in practice, it will do this. And then we use our relative read write bug from the first array to overwrite the backing store pointer of our adjacent array, our typed array. And then in our typed array, we can access element zero either as a read or a write. And then we get an arbitrary read write primitive. That's how we do it. So also typically to implement these types of exploits, we need another primitive to defeat things like ASLR and to do other types of things as well. We need an address of primitive. Uh, and it's very easy to do that with a relative read write bug uh, or an out of bounds read write bug that we have. We won't get into sort of this primitive, uh, but we can actually just build an array um, and we can read the element of array and put it with a pointer. So it's actually quite easy to, to develop an address of primitive in Firefox. Now, we've got this arbitrary read-write primitive that allows us to write anywhere in memory. Now, remember, we got that relative read-write bug which overwrote an adjacent array's pointer. And now when we access that array's pointer, we get an arbitrary read-write. So we find, you know, this is our sort of our last part of our strategy and exploitation. We want to find a writable function pointer, okay? And we want to overwrite it. And, and this is the purpose of this exploit here because we're not breaking out of the sandbox. So this is entirely legitimate technique for what sort of the video that we showed in the video that we'll play at the end. We're going to overwrite, uh, uh, we're going to overwrite a function pointer with a call to system, which is a library called an execute shell commands. And then we're going to trigger that function pointer. And this is really control flow hijacking 101. There's no control flow integrity in the renderer process running the JavaScript engine. So we can quite easily hijack control flow arbitrarily without any other concerns. So, you know, the question is then, where do we get these function pointers from? We need, we need these function pointers. Where do we find a writable function pointer that is going to be hijacked, that we, that we can hijack and overwrite with the libc call to system? And that brings us to the global offset table. 
Now, as part of dynamic linking, and Firefox does dynamic link, it's a dynamically linked executable. As part of dynamic linking, there's a set of function pointers pointing to library calls that, that are used by the application. And at runtime, those function pointers get filled in with their correct addresses as runtime linking occurs. Now, by default, this is done lazily at runtime. So the idea is that the, the addresses aren't filled in initially to, to where they're sort of going to end up. But when you first make a call to printf or, 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 or gets or <laughs> fgets or write or something like that, um, it'll get filled in and fill in this global offset table entry. So it's just a table of function pointers that are used for resolving imports. So the address table or the global offset table needs to be writable and it's a very easy target to overwrite function pointers and hijack control flow. Now, global offset table attacks have been known about for almost, you know, 20 years pretty much. You know, since, you know, 20 years this has been known about, uh, maybe even longer, maybe 25 years. And there's the mitigation to prevent this type of classic control flow hijacking attack by overriding, overriding the global offset table. And it's a set of mitigations surrounding this read-only relocations or railroad uh, technique. And railroad basically forces symbol resolution and import resolution and dynamic linking to occur at load time, at program load time. And then once it's mapped all the sort of the once it's resolved all the appropriate imports and addresses, it remaps the global offset table as non-writable. So at runtime, if you're if you've got an export, you can't overwrite the global offset table. That's a pretty standard technique that pretty much everyone uses to mitigate this whole set of function pointers that are in a sort of a standard process. The thing is, Firefox and SpiderMonkey don't use it. And it's there's really no valid reason why in the modern era that they don't use this mitigation. I mean, it's a standard mitigation that's been around for, you know, for a long time. And every other binary uses it except Firefox. So you know, even if Firefox did use it, there are other function pointers we can hijack anyway. But I mean, this is a pretty standard mitigation. So we're going to use it. We're going to use this um, this weakness, I suppose, because they're not using this well-known mitigation. And we're going to replace a global offset table entry for the library call uh, menmove. Um, and we're going to replace um, we're going to replace the global offset table entry for menmove with the global offset table entry that contains system. Okay. So when we call actually some JavaScript code, and in particular this copy within function, that code in JavaScript actually triggers a call to memmove using the global offset table pointer. And because we've replaced it with the system pointer, it'll actually call system. And we can control the argument that gets passed to system uh, by appropriate use of JavaScript. And so we can basically execute arbitrary shell commands from within JavaScript by replacing the memmove global offset table entry uh, with a pointer to system. So how do you determine the addresses um, you know, for the global offset table? We have an arbitrary write primitive, so an arbitrary read write primitive. So we need so we can overwrite the global offset table in our JavaScript exploit. But how do we get that sort of the address for it? Um, well, let's use a naive method first. If we can leak a pointer. If we can leave a pointer in the text or data segment of the application, then the global offset table is a fixed offset. And the system API call is a fixed offset from our, lib, from our text or data segment base address. So how can we leak this particular pointer and reveal that address of the global offset table? So again, in typed arrays, JavaScript structures in memory, there is a fixed pointer into the text segment as one of the sort of members of this JavaScript typed array in memory. So we can actually determine the got address as a hard-coded fixed offset from our leaked pointer that we got from a JavaScript typed array. And this works effectively against all mitigations uh, in the renderer process. Uh, we're not tackling gaining code execution outside of the sandbox um, in the browser process. Um, but, you know, actually, if we hard code offsets for the global offset table, you know, from this fixed pointer, it's actually a problem. Um, you know, this is actually, um, this is actually not good because if you just recompile your application, these offsets are probably going to change. So different versions of Firefox and SpiderMonkey are probably going to have different offsets. So it's not very reliable uh, at all. So that gets us on to the next part of the lecture, 
you know, the next part of the presentation is how do we how do we engineer our, our exploit now so that we actually have a reliable exploit that works on different versions of um, Spider Monkey and different versions of Firefox. We need to apply systems development now. We need to apply some engineering to figure out how to do this. So we want to make our exploit reliable against different versions and configurations of software of our of our Firefox software. And so we're going to use, in fact, um, standard and traditional systems development and engineering to do that. This is really an engineering problem. This isn't so much hacking anymore. We need to develop, you know, good engineering skills and good systems development to do this. So there are smart ways of determining the global offset table addresses. And in fact, the global offset table is well defined uh, in the ELF object file format or executable linking format, which is a native file format for executables and other types of object code in Linux. So we're going to write an object file parser that finds the headers in memory pass those ELF headers, figure out where the GOT is from our ELF headers, and then map our you know, dynamic symbol names to GOT addresses as well. So ELF headers get mapped into the image starting at the image base address in memory. So we need to be able to find the base address of our image in memory from the application, our Firefox application, um, to pass those ELF headers. So how do we determine that? Well, let's start off with our earlier pointer leak that we got sort of in the last part. We can still use that pointer leak. It points somewhere into the text segment. Uh, and that's enough that we can actually scan backwards in memory one page at a time until we get to the ELF magic or marker that identifies the beginning of the ELF headers. And hex 7F ELF identifies the beginning of the ELF headers in memory. So we just go back to the beginning of each page, keep on scanning backwards in memory using our arbitrary read, write, primitive in JavaScript in our exploit, and then we find the image base. So the, a detailed like look at ELF is sort of out of scope for this presentation, but if we want to figure out the global offset table, we need to pass the ELF headers, pass the program headers, pass the dynamic se segment, pass the dynamic relocations, pass the dynamic symbols, and eventually that will give us our GOT addresses relative to our image base. Okay, so this is all ELF passing, and this is the, basically the same thing that happens when uh, an executable is executed uh, on your system and loaded by the dynamic linker and loaded by your operating system kernel. So we implement this ELF parser. I mean, we can find the global offset table using a really reliable technique because it's just following the object file format specification. So this is, you know, it should work all the time because we're just, we're literally doing what the specifications say. So we do implement, you know, we've implemented this ELF parser, and unfortunately now other things start to break. Our arbitrary read-write primitive, you know, now we have to like do, we're doing an enormous amount of passing in memory. You know, we're passing hundreds of bytes, thousands of bytes to do these ELF header passing, and our arbitrary read-write primitive doesn't work reliably. After about 50 uses of our primitive, it starts to give us incorrect data. So our exploit no longer works with the same level of reliability on a single Firefox build. And, and why is that so? And can we fix it? And TLDR, we can fix it. So garbage collection in JavaScript, in the JavaScript engine is a significant issue in exploit reliability. And in fact, in SpiderMonkey, the JavaScript engine for Firefox, there are two different heaps. Typed arrays, the, one, the, the ones that we've been using for our exploit go into the nursery heap. And after about 50 uses of this data in the nursery heap, the objects are moved into a different heap called the tenured heap. All this memory juggling between the nursery and tenured heap causes problems to the reliability of our exploit because the objects get reallocated to different positions in memory and we can no longer rely that our, you know, our adjacent objects are actually valid anymore. So we want to build a stable arbitrary read-write primitive. This is our next step. We've got one way of developing a, we've got a, you know, we've got a, a relative read-write, an out-of-bounds memory corruption bug. We want to turn this into a stable arbitrary read-write primitive. So that's our goal. We want a very stable arbitrary read-write primitive. And our strategy is to convert our arbitrary read-write primitive that we currently have it from a typed array into an arbitrary read-write primitive into a different array called an array buffer, which is stored on that tenured heap. So the goal of our sort of our exploit now, 
to build it, to convert our arbitrary read-write primitive into a stable arbitrary read-write primitive is we're going to allocate two array buffers and we're going to use our initial arbitrary read-write primitive and our address of primitive as well, which we got earlier. And we're going to change the size of the first array buffer. And we're going to make it such that it extends incorrectly into the adjacent array buffer. And that basically means the first array buffer now is, is an out-of-bounds relative read-write primitive that we can use. And we follow the same strategy as before. We use our relative read-write primitive in the first array buffer to overwrite the backing store pointer of the second array buffer. And bingo, we have a stable arbitrary read-write primitive that we can use for the rest of our exploit, exploit very reliably. So we run this exploit um, inside, you know, in, in, against Firefox instead of the standalone spider monkey, um, and our exploit doesn't work. So we're running it, running it against the browser now instead of testing against the JavaScript engine directly. And it turns out that the virtual memory layout is different when we run spider monkey or the JavaScript engine standalone versus inside a browser. And in fact, our code finds the image base of the JavaScript engine library and not the Firefox. Uh, applications image base. So now what we have to do is pass the runtime linker mappings to find all of these deal, you know, these uh, these libraries in memory and find the application at the bottom of it. So in Linux, it, uh, there's a runtime linker. It's the, the GNU runtime linker, and it maintains an internal representation of libraries and images that it has loaded, and it stores these in a linked list maintained on the heap. And there's a sort of a, a, an important structure in the runtime linker uh, in Linux that is called uh, a link map. And the link map maintains, this is stored in a linked list, and, and it maintains the path name of the library image, the base address, and other types of information as well. So it turns out, according, you know, sort of to, the, you know, this is standard Linux now, a pointer to the link map associated with this object is kept in the first address of the global offset table. And so alternatively, you can use the dynamic uh, entries uh, in the Yelp headers as well. Uh, it, might be, it might be there, but it's probably um, easy to add to our previous Elf parser. And we can use that Elf parser to pull out the first GOT entry and extract a link map pointer. And our link map pointer points into the middle of this link list that maintains these objects. And we traverse the link list, we traverse the link map structure backwards until we get to the link map head head and that's our application. So that, and we're able to do that now. So the next part, of course, is to resolve the system library call. And it turns out the system library call isn't maintained in the main images global offset table. And it's unreliable to assume that it's in the got of another library call, of another library that's loaded into memory. But what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna find libc in memory and then we're gonna pass the elf headers of that so basically, we're simulating dynamic linking now, and we're going to do symbol resolution for the system library call. But again, first we need the libc image base. Now, we could pass the link maps to get the libc image base. We've got code for that. Didn't end up using that. Instead, I used another approach of just finding a, a got entry. We've got ways to get all the got entries out. And just a got entry with an associated libc function, if it's been resolved, then the got entry points into libc, and now we find the image base from that leak pointer using our previous technique of walking backwards, uh, walking backwards in the image until we get to that elf, that hex 7f elf header. So you're getting complicated now, getting complicated, but you know this is sort of, sort of what we've done. Okay, so I can see people on the IRC saying they missed uh, a few things now. What context is the runtime linker? The runtime linker, I'm sort of answering questions at the same time. The runtime linker is responsible for runtime linking of the application against all the libraries. So any library in Firefox is handled by the runtime linker. So the runtime linker should know everything that's in memory in terms of the libraries that are being used. But putting it all together, we're using our um, out of bounds read write, relative read write to give us an initial arbitrary read-write. We're using our initial arbitrary read-write to build a stable arbitrary read-write. We're leaking a pointer to the text segment um, in, that, in that library for JavaScript engine from a typed array. 
then we're walking backwards in memory to find the image space of that library. We're going to build the GOT by passing the ELF headers. Okay. Then we're going to find the link map associated with that, with that, the, with that library. We're going to find the beginning link map, which gives us our image base of the entire application, the main application. And then we're going to find a got entry for a libc uh, function to calculate the libc image base, resolve the system symbol in libc by passing the libc elf headers. And then we're going to overwrite the function pointer for mem move with system, trigger a call to mem move, and now we've hijacked control flow. So this is sort of you're starting to get pretty complicated here, but this is this is what's required to make a reliable exploit. Um, a reliable exploit. And yes, this can be um, re-implemented on non-Linux platforms, absolutely. I'm just reading the IRC as well. Absolutely, these are sort of well, these are standard sort of um, standard approaches and uh, Windows has its own set of associated things as well. So recapping our exploit. Our exploit is pretty reliable now. It's actually super reliable. Um, you know, I, I've given this talk before at a, at a sex talk camera and I'm, I'm, I'm quite confident that I can you know, run the exploit and it's gonna, you know, not crash. Uh, you know, uh, you know when when I run it, uh, most of the, you know almost all of all of the time, it works on different Firefox builds and versions. It performs symbol resolution and on-the-fly passing uh, of the in-memory runtime linker and else structures. Had no hard-coded offsets to resolve symbols, and is and is super good. So this is our reliable exploit now that that works on different versions that follows the you know follows the standards and follows the specifications and we think is going to sort of, you know, be with us for a while. So again, the video is not playing very well, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to do what I did before and just skip through various parts of it. We're starting Firefox. It's much more impactful. The, it's about uh, 12 or 1500 lines of JavaScript code is the exploit. So we've got our, we've opened up our, our browser. Uh, we've gone to our, our page with our exploit in it. Uh, oh, there's there's our exploit. We've, you know, of course, we're following good coding practices, so we've got a few uh, JavaScript files, of course. Um, we're going to click on that spider monkey out of bounds exploit.html. Um, and what do we get? We're going to click on it. We're going to click on it. And hopefully, if we're lucky, we popped up a calculator and we had something on our HTML page as well. It's so much more impactful with the video, but unfortunately, this is just the streaming that we have at the, the, the streaming that I've got set up at the moment. So you'll just have to be happy with that. I, I can see some discussions talking about um, um, that Fedora 32 has has the mitigation installed and the Mozilla one. Uh, oh, interesting, interesting. So maintenance, maintenance. Okay, so we've got a reliable exploit, don't we? You know, do we break? And I've been doing this testing on Ubuntu, by the way. Do we have? You know, is it time to break out the beer and champagne? You know, we're sort of kicked back. We've, you've written an exploit. You know, is our job as an exploit developer done now? And no, our job is not done. We're not. You know, this is we, we're still. You know, in the middle of you know of, of, you know of our work here. You know, we want to maintain our exploit. We don't want to be reactive in exploit development. We should be proactive in maintaining our exploits. And we should predict future engineering requirements to maintain a working exploit. So we need to sort of, we need to make sure that our exploit isn't going to become obsolete. If Firefox changes something um, or the system changes something, you know, what's going to happen? So. Certainly, our Firefox exploit is dependent on JavaScript object memory layout. So JavaScript, different Firefox versions, they might change that. I mean, this could change our exploit. The runtime linker maps are pretty standard. They're not, they're not going to change. The ELF runtime linker is not going to change. Our Firefox JavaScript objects may, may change. Yeah, the RHEL row is a good example of that. So also our vulnerability might get killed underneath us. It could be susceptible to a very early death if there are new security mitigations that are introduced to prevent exploitability, even if the actual bug remains unfixed. So we've got a bug in Firefox and our exploit doesn't work because there's a new mitigation. So we need to be aware of, of these new mitigations and we need to be aware of how to bypass them, you know, so that we avoid problems in the future. 
So Firefox doesn't use Railroad. Um, it's almost certainly going to change. I mean, you know, month, one year, three years. It's an easy mitigation to introduce. It requires a compile time link to change. So it could literally happen overnight if the Firefox devs wanted to, which would kill our exploit if we don't have other strategies in place. So, you know, and also our exploit isn't very useful when it's used in a chain that includes a sandbox escape. So, you know, shell command execution in our current exploit would immediately be blocked. And we would want our shell code execution to launch the next link in our exploit chain, whether that's a sandbox escape or a privesque and so forth. Now on Chrome or V8, we can actually create shell code really easily. In fact, in Chrome, if you create WebAssembly, it'll actually generate readable, writable, and executable pages in memory for you. So you can just simply write your shell code to the, these RWX pages with your arbitrary read-write primitive um, and execute it. So that you don't even have to worry about all of you know, this additional stuff. In Chrome you know, lets you write, do this you know, really easily. Now, all the main browsers except Chrome and only Chrome in the case of WebAssembly have eliminated uh, RWX pages. Yeah, so the, the browser is separate to the, yeah, it, there's an IPC mechanism, but it is separate, just answering the questions on the IRC. So Chrome is certainly going to fix this hole eventually. So they won't have the RWX pages indefinitely. So you can't rely on this strategy for long-term shellcode execution. Sure, for the, you know, the immediate future, you can do this, but certainly in the long term, they're going to change this for sure. Now, one thing that you could do uh, and you can do this in SpiderMonkey, is create arbitrary numeric constants of eight bytes in your JavaScript code. And the JavaScript engine will compile that eight byte sequence into readable and executable memory. So you can basically embed shellcode gadgets or ROP gadgets, or even just entire shellcode into these numeric constants. And if you use shellcode and chain these constants together by embedding a two byte short jump, you can embed shellcode that and it protects an attacker control buffer representing shell code so that it's executable. So Chrome and V8 have a mitigation against this particular technique and it's called constant blinding. And it basically says that numeric constants that are gonna be used in, in the JavaScript code have a simple encoding with a random and changing XOR key. So an attacker can't get a predictable byte sequence into executable pages nor easily read that XOR key. So Constant blinding is a mitigation that Firefox says they won't use. So, but you know, and they've written a blog, they've written an article about this, or an, an answered an email saying that they think constant blinding is a superficial mitigation and they won't introduce it since it has a moderate performance impact. So, on Firefox, bring your own gadget as a, as an attack seems to be pretty good, and it'll work. You know, even once they fix up that that GOT. So if, you, if they start about, you know, if they start thinking about introducing um, constant blinding, we should have some awareness that there's going to be public discussion, at least on their mailing list, before they implement it. Still, still, it's uh, we need a technique on Chrome and V8. I, I actually talked to that um, lecturer. Uh, there's a comment on the um, uh, on the IRC. I, I'm, I'm a lecturer at uh, uh, I'm a lecturer at ANU, so I actually spoke to to this particular person about, about Chrome as well. Uh, one of the developers is at Chrome, uh, is at ANU. So one, um, one approach we can use to partially defeat constant blinding, so this is what Chrome uses now, Firefox won't use it. We don't have to use this because Firefox, we can do a normal attack, bring your own gadgets. We can find gadgets at runtime by, and build a rock chain on the fly. So basically it's similar to finding that elf magic in the text segment, you know, you're using our elf parser and going backwards in memory and scanning memory using our arbitrary read write. We can simply search for gadgets that match our, what we need for our rock chain. And we build a rock chain to protect our shell code to be executable. So typically um, a rock chain constructed like this where we've, we've assembled a bunch of gadgets together, we need some sort of stack pivot because our chain um, probably not on the stack. So we need to make some sort of stack pivot. And it turns out that useful stack pivots are hard to find. And using traditional ROP gadget finding tools hasn't really proven effective to find us uh, stack pivots in Chrome. So I decided to automate stack pivot detection. I use the Unicorn emulator and I'll take the Chrome image and the libraries associated with it 
and I'll emulate every 64-bit instruction and every offset in every library in memory. And when the emulation hits a RET instruction, I'll check if any general purpose registers have been copied to the stack pointer, because if they have, then it's a stack pivot. And that completely automates finding stack, stack pivot gadgets uh, in this particular case. And that's still a work in progress. The stack pivots I found aren't great. It seems fragile. There aren't that many stack pivots that are useful. Um, another approach is to simply overwrite the stack directly with the rock chain, with, with, a, with the rock chain using our arbitrary rewrite primitive. So we don't need a stack, but we just overwrite the stack. But firstly, we need a leak of where the stack is in memory. And in fact, there's a there's a there's a global variable that we can use our elf parser to find from libc and whatnot. The environment global variable in libc contains a pointer on the stack, so we can use that to to find where the stack is and put our rock chain there. So we just use our libc image base finder, our elf parser, and our symbol resolver, and we've got it again. So the attack I described on building a rock chain assumes something that there's no backwards edge control flow integrity. So we assume that we can just overwrite return addresses on the stack and we can hijack control flow like that and build a rock chain. Uh, but, you know, our attack probably isn't going to work indefinitely since control flow integrity is being used or is going to be used in lots of places uh, in, in the short or near term future. And there's software control flow integrity uh, so software forward edge control flow integrity exists in things like control flow guard, the open source CLang compiler. But the renderer process of Firefox, where our JavaScript engine bugs live, don't use control flow integrity on current platforms. Uh, the browser process does use control flow integrity on a number of platforms, and that sort of will be challenging with our sandbox escape as well. Now, Control flow enforcement technology, or CET, is an upcoming Intel standard to add into hardware backwards edge control flow integrity in x86 using, sh using shadow call stacks. And on ARM, we have pointer authentication, which is in hardware to add forwards and backwards edge control flow integrity and is used in many mobile phones. So control flow integrity is going to be a problem for us. I mean, it, it, you know, this type of hardware mitigation is probably going to kill our, our sort of our rock chain approach. It won't kill it on Chrome where we have readable, writable, and executable pages, but I mean, and it won't kill it currently on Firefox, which just has a, um, you know, but, but it might kill us, might kill us in the future. So memory tagging is another um, standard in hardware that is yet to be used in production. It's used in testing by a few vendors. Um, and it's going to kill many types of memory corruption bugs. And Google have experimented with it for Android in testing. And I'd expect the same publicity as pointer authentication when memory tagging um, is in use um, in, in, in production on the, on the mainstream. And you have to think about pointer authentication. I mean, if you were watching hardware mitigations, you saw that pointer authentication was available in standard for a year before it was being used um, by major vendors. So, I mean, these mitigations don't come out of nowhere you can see that there are, are going to be problems for our, our humble little, you know, remote code execution exploit or technique uh, on Firefox. So that brings me sort of to the end now. I finished a little bit early, but that's okay. I sort of spoke quite fast, I think. So hopefully, hopefully you've seen some of the challenges of, of writing an exploit, how to gain arbitrary code execution, and some of the challenges of engineering of engineering an exploit so that, that it works reliably and that you future-proof it against mitigations. So I presented one link of the exploitation chain. Given an exploitable memory corruption bug in the Firefox JavaScript engine, then get code execution. A modern full-chain exploit re requires many more links. So it's no wonder you know, that the teams who can develop working exploits on modern targets is shrinking every year and I don't know, maybe, maybe it does justify the high price of zero days. Is this the death of memory corruption? I mean, we've, you know, is, you know, pointer authentication, control flow integrity, everything else, data protection as well. It, you know, is it going to be the, end, the death of memory corruption? And I will say that memory corruption exploitation has been dying or almost completely dead every year for at least the last 10 years. However, where there is a will, there is a way. 
the value of exploitation is so high that it will simply be financed by well-resourced re well actors until the outcome is achieved, in my opinion. And the chances that, you know, reality check, the chances that the general public is going to be affected by an iPhone zero-day jailbreak in the wild is unlikely to non-existent. Existent. But, you know, if you're a senior politician, you know, maybe, you know, you should be concerned about this type of stuff. Modern exploitation is still publicly discussed in some forums. Um, some of the solutions to top tier CTF challenges, you know, are amazing. And, and really, it's, it's just amazing to see what people can do. The jailbreak community in recent years has also seen renewed activity with things like Checkrain and, and, and some of the boot ROM exploit and, and whatnot that have come out. Google Project Zero posts zero days regularly. It's sort of a great source of things to read about. And, you know, if you did like memory corruption, and I hope by now that you, you do see a little bit of joy in memory corruption, um, join the Big Slides camera Slack. We also have Seasides Monthly, which is hosting virtually now. Do some of InfoSec's commercial, commercial virtual or face-to-face -face trainings and attend our InfoSec social nights, which are free for everyone to come in person, in Canberra, every Thursday, see our meetup groups. And we do other events as well. And this type of stuff is done in a friendly and cooperative environment where we often do show and tell and show what we're working on. So thanks for listening. And I'll try to take any questions that I haven't already answered uh, from IRC or wherever else they might be. So thank you very much. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks so much. It's always beautiful to, to listen to your talk, well structured. And I quite like the part that you start engineering your your effort and uh, and also the maintenance part. This is interesting. I'm also working from the other's perspective of more defensive way that how you need to engineer your patch. It's not just putting an if clause and you kind of you patch your bug. There's a lot to go there. And it's quite interesting you're coming from the other side and looking at reliability of the of the bug you found. Well, there were there were quite a few traffic as you could see in both IRC and Jitsi. I have collected two of the questions, which I think was not covered. So the first one was from S, from SXW. Why are Firefox devs so resistant to these mitigation techniques? From your perspective, I, I think if I read the um, if I read I, I read their thread on the on their mailing list, and I think they tried to put it in at some point and. There was some issue at some point that that, that it was removed. Uh, it is like a like an outstanding ticket, but then it got closed and saying, oh, they just won't implement it. I think they will get around to it eventually. I think it's just like they tried it quickly. They had some problem. They they reverted, and they just haven't got around to it again and closed the ticket. So, I mean, it'll happen in the future. And, why, and also why they're resistant to constant blinding is probably another good question mm. as a mitigation. They, were, you know, they, they haven't done the read-only relocation stuff. Uh, and the and the buy now stuff, um, uh, but the um, constant blinding. They just think that the that Chrome is just doing it superficially for the perception of security. And um, the mm. the Firefox devs, I quote, I'm going to paraphrase, even though I'm just saying I'm quoting them. They say it's a superficial mitigation that can be defeated very easily. Um, I don't think that's entirely true. I think it's a good mitigation, but um, the Firefox devs thinks that that it's just. Um, that it's just for show, to be honest. This is what I'm interpreting anyway. Um, I think it's a good mitigation, mm -hmm. but the Firefox devs think that it's sort of, you know, it's just security theater, and so they won't accept the impact of performance on their system um, in terms of that particular mitigation. But then again, Chrome is still reading okay. quite a lot of executable pages, so what can they say? <laughs> well, I <laughs> hope that answered, the, that answered their question. All right, we've got more questions coming. Um, every V8-based program having this bug? I think you're referring to well, um, if you have custom JavaScript and, and, and you're able to execute JavaScript um, at the attacker's choosing, then they can create RWX pages. So, you know, that's not an, an, a, a, like a, 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 it just means that they don't have, you know, all the mitigations in place. It doesn't mean that they're going to be vulnerable to an attack or anything like that. You still have to have a memory corruption bug as well as the rest of it. It just means that that a mitigation what that, that other vendors have implemented currently, Chrome is a bit behind on. And they will 
fix it at some point in terms of implementing this mitigation, but they just haven't done that yet. So I don't, I don't want to say that, you know, Chrome is, is, is terrible, like this is a, a massive security problem. It's not a massive security problem. It just means that they're not using, um, you know, the best security mitigation, the state-of-the-art security mitigations that we all know um, significantly improve the, um, you know, its defensibility against the exploitation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um... Any good resources for learning about Elf Linker me metadata? I've been trying to wrap my head around it for a while, and it is hard. This is from. I promise I, I won't promo my own course, which goes over it at the <laughs> sec. <laughs> but if you just Google like track articles, um, there's some documentation yeah. of the Elf stuff as well. A really good article as well is um, that I really like. It's a really old article now, but Elf hasn't changed that much, you know, in you know, in a while. Like a whirlwind tour of writing Teensy executables is a really fun look at um, manipulating the ELF file format and, um, and 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 making it do interesting things. I think that's a really good article. Uh, plus, I, I, I you know many years ago I wrote some like a frac article on the global offset table um, and hijacking that in ELF. And I've written other stuff as well, and a few other people have written ELF topics as well uh, since that time as well. All right, perfect. Okay, I think I should have covered all the questions. Uh, there is also one question. I think this is this would be an interesting one. And I think the question is from Shana, if I'm right. Uh, so you talked about, at the beginning of your slide, that it is not generally a pen tester that gets into writing exploit. So what is that thing about someone that graviates toward exploit dev? And how do you know if it is in you? <laughs> well, um, if you like it, I mean, you know, the proof is in the pudding. If you enjoy it, then you know, go for it. I mean, um, I mean, you gotta, you, there's, you gotta have like, there, there is like all these. I, I'm sure you could draw a Venn diagram of like a hacker mentality and you know, systems <laughs> developer and, and you know, wanting to get you know email spills on someone's box and that somewhere there'd be some overlap that would be like, you know, binary exploit developer. But um, um, you know. A little bit of column A, a little bit from column B. There is absolutely the hacker mentality and the hacker mindset, you know, in terms of looking at stuff and saying, well, you know, I can see ways to bypass that. I'll do that. So, um, I mean, this is one for the psychs and the psychology people, I think, um, to figure out what makes up a person, uh, you know, do these things or not. So I'll leave that one for the for Dr. <laughs> Phil on TV. <laughs> OK, there is one more question. Will using, oh, this is one interesting, will using Rust for programming help protect against these kind of exploits? Yeah, so Firefox does actually use Rust components, um, believe it or not. Um, so they, so, so um, they, are, they actually do have some Rust code in, the, in their code. Um, but, I mean, one of the things about Rust that Firefox uses, it passes pointers to the underlying um, system memory manager in the Rust code in an unsafe way. So, I mean, if you can pass arbitrary pointers, you know, from Rust to the underlying system, yes. maybe you could do something with that. Maybe. There are attacks on the heap allocator where if you pass an arbitrary pointer, you can make it do interesting stuff. So just because they're using Rust, you know, doesn't mean that they're 100% yeah. secure as well. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Do we have more questions? Was there anything that I missed? Mm. Maybe not by the looks of it, but thanks again, Sylvia. For Thank you very much for having me. Your time. Uh, so Thank you. Thanks so much. And uh, so what I want to say is, so the IRC channel will be live. The GTC also will be will be there for, for us to, to hang around and answer questions. I would like to thank again everyone who helped us for this event to happen. A special thanks to Shana and Sylvia for joining us and whoever joined us live on this Saturday evening and morning. I, re I, did I forgot to mention why we picked this time. As you could guess, this was something that also people overseas, I mean, outside Australia, can also join us. So kind of a relatively a, a better time. Like before, thanks again. And yeah, please... Uh, let us know what you guys think, and if you have any other feedbacks, we will be online. Bye.